My name is Michael Obermeyer. I am the Vice President and a signature member of the California Art Club. My name is Andrea Mosley and I'm actually a mentor member uh, with California Art Club. Hi, I'm William Stout. I'm a signature member of the California Art Club, the oldest art organization west of the Mississippi. And I'm also on the advisory board of the California Art Club. I've been with the club probably 20, 22 years now. And I joined them right as I was starting to switch over from illustration as a profession to the fine arts, mostly plein air painting. The California Art Club is one of the oldest and largest painting and sculptor groups, artist groups in the country. I think it's 111 years old right now. What started out as a group of painters has now become a group of painting, drawing, and sculpting members. I found the CAC when I started doing fine art. Probably the late 90s, some of the other artists were talking about the California Art Club and how I should join and get involved. I had gotten involved with a plein air group down in Laguna Beach, and I really wanted to branch out and meet more artists, especially in Los Angeles, where I was raised. And I started getting their newsletters and saw that the amazing programs and paint outs they offered, the mentor programs, I wanted to get involved. So I started heading to some of the meetings, got to know Peter Adams, the president, and some of the painters and sculptors that were at the gold medal show, the first one I visited, and right then I knew I wanted to be a part of this, and they become like a family for me. I actually was in an art show, and um, one of the judges came across my work, and I ended up winning Best in Show, and talking to him later on, this member, his name's Christopher Sladoff, said, you should not be in this. Your, your level is far too high for the show that you're in. And he said, you need to be a part of California Art Club. And I hadn't even actually heard of California Art Club before that, so I looked them up and went to his studio and talked to him a little bit more and then I applied for the mentor membership at the time. Before I made my first Antarctica trip, I realized I had never ever created art in cold weather conditions. And I really didn't know anything about how to do that. And I noticed in the newspaper, in the Pasadena Weekly, that there was an art exhibition by a painter who went to Tibet in the Himalayas. And I thought, oh, this, this sounds like a perfect thing to see right now. And I went to see it, it was at the Pacific Asia Museum. And sure enough, here was a guy working in cold weather conditions, creating beautiful, beautiful pieces of work and, and art. And I looked at his name, it was Peter Adams. And reading the material about the exhibition, I realized, oh my God, Peter Adams, he lives in Pasadena. That's where I live. And so I looked him up on the phone book and called him. And Peter was so gracious. He invited me over and he gave me a crash course in cold weather painting. One of the things he said was that if you want to do watercolors at the airport, buy one of those little tiny vodka bottles. And when you're ready to paint, mix a little bit with your water and your water won't freeze. And then you drink a little bit and then you won't freeze. And he also uh, used pastels a lot, I noticed. And Peter was so generous. He gave me an entire box set of pastels to take with me on my first trip to Antarctica. And Man, I, I've never forgotten that. And shortly after that, Peter was offered the presidency of the California Art Club, and he said, I'll do it under one condition. Actually, he had several conditions, but one of the conditions was uh, Bill Stout and Dan Guzay have to immediately be made signature members in the club. And they agreed to that, and I've been with the club ever since. I was one of the first people chose to participate in the revival of the California Art Club. There is so much to offer for any artist, no matter what level you are. If you're a beginner or if you're someone, a signature member, say, who does this as a career and who hangs in galleries. They also provide the wonderful gold medal show, which we just finished our 109th, and that is the best of the best, juried, hangs in an art museum each year. And that's kind of like the Academy Awards for me. You get dressed up, you get to meet collectors, mingle with collectors and other artists from around the country even, and see the best work that the California Art Club has to offer. It's really been a blessing for me. I've had a lot of people that I've met through it. I've been in several of their gold medal shows and I was on the cover of their like magazine for the gold medal show. So it's been wonderful. I've, I've, I've loved being part of it. Growing up, I was always drawing as a child 
and I wanted to learn a little more about drawing and painting. And I was, you know, taken by the early Renaissance painters, traditional and realist painters that really caught my eye. And I've just wanted to hone in on that kind of drawing painting skill, whether it was out painting landscapes or in the studio painting a portrait of the figure. That's always really resonated with me more so than modern art or abstract or deconstructionist. It's just a traditional realism art that, that just grabbed my, my heart from the beginning. When I was younger and starting to go into art, I knew that I wanted to learn a traditional method. I wanted to be able to paint what I see. And I was looking for a place that I could learn. So I found a place in Italy, Angel Academy of Art, and I ended up going there on and off for five years. I finished the base program, which was three years, and I did a year of graduate work, which was in portraiture. And I just found that it really was something that I gravitated towards. Like my natural inclination was to paint realism. I am probably the most diverse artist in the club. I've worked in almost every field of art that you can think of. I've made motion pictures, done concert posters, album covers, t-shirt designs, designed theme parks for Disney and Universal. Boy, you name it, I've done it. One of my favorite things is having adventures around the world and painting what I see. I approached the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I showed the director, Craig Black, my first five paintings, and he said, you got your show, and we will travel it for you. The show was meant to raise awareness amongst the public of how important it is to preserve Antarctica. And just to make sure that every kid would bring their parent to see the show, I made half the show prehistoric Antarctica. And it worked out great, because the kids wanted to see the dinosaurs that were in Antarctica, and so they'd bring their parents to the show, and it was a very successful show. And after I finished the Antarctica show, I had this sensation I'd never felt before, which was, I think I could do this the rest of my life. I didn't want to stop. So I decided to make a big book on the history of life of Antarctica from earliest prehistoric times to the present day. And my goal is 100 oil paintings. I've finished 80 now. I saved the hardest ones for last. And uh, I think that will be probably the most important book that I ever do. Having my paintings hanging in exhibitions for the California Art Club, it's like a dream come true for me because when I started painting, I had no place to hang or show them. And with the club, it forces me to kind of raise my level of painting and skill a little bit so I don't embarrass myself. It also gives me an opportunity to get my work out there for other people to see, and that's really important, especially for me who is trying to do this as a career, uh, transitioning from illustration to painting. I think the relevance of representational and traditional art is important. In a way, you have to learn the rules before you want to break them. And I see traditional realist art more as like classical music or ballet, where it really forces you to hone your skills, whether it's drawing or painting or sculpture. And then from there, you can use your own voice and branch out from that. I started volunteering a little bit, and I noticed that I volunteered. I got to meet more people. I got to meet collectors artists from different parts of California that I would never have met. And just, just mixing up with art historians, collectors, artists, people who love art and traditional realist art like I do, just made a huge difference for my confidence as a painter. I think the attitude towards traditional art is changing. A huge element in that change is my friend Robert Williams, who does what he calls cartoon surrealism. And he really changed everything. He curated a huge show called Car Culture for the Laguna Museum of Art. Fantastic success. So he got invited, I think, by the Museum of Modern Art here in Los Angeles to put together a show. It was a gigantic show. And then Robert started a magazine called Juxtapose. It is now the best-selling art magazine in the United States. And it is not abstract. It is all realism. A lot of it cartooned realism, but it is all realism. So. Robert kind of snuck us all in through the back door. He didn't go through the traditional art critic thing. In fact, he sort of blindsided the art critics. They were not prepared or expecting this gigantic art movement to suddenly emerge from this underground culture. And so I give Robert a lot of credit for reviving the interest in traditional art. I feel like for a long time, everything was modern, especially in California. And now I feel that there is this resurgence of the traditional fine art, the representation art and that comes across in shows there's a lot more schools that you're able to find when I went to school in Italy it was really one of the few schools out there and now they're kind of popping up all over the states I make representational art because I want to connect 
with the emotions of the public. I think the best work has an emotional content, an intellectual content, and a spiritual content. And I like to combine the three of those into each piece. If I do that, I feel I'm successful. It's difficult to do that with abstract art. The general public wants to latch onto something familiar that they can take away with them, or it'll something that'll enter their heart. And so my favorite artists were mostly the late 19th century artists and also the early 20th century illustrators in America. And so that's who I studied to get good, and they still have a real strong influence on me. I think it's so important for artists to be in a community. First of all, as an artist, we're in a very solitary kind of environment. I can be in my studio painting for hours at a time, having a conversation with myself, which never goes well. Or even out in the field painting, I'm alone normally. So it, it's good to, to mix and mingle with other artists, to create with each other, advise each other. It's just so important. And, and, and to almost kind of um, encourage each other. It can get very hard and depressing sometimes. Most artists are the worst critic. It's good to go out and share that kind of kindred spirit with other painters and sculptors. It can be a lonely profession, unless you're working on something like a motion picture or you're working with hundreds, if not thousands of people. But usually you're at your easel or in your studio all alone, and you don't really know if your work is affecting anyone. If you make some little breakthrough or discovery, there's no one to share it with. But if you're in a group like the California Art Club, you can get together with like-minded people and share what you've learned and learn from them. And it makes life a lot less lonely. It is important to expand as an artist and seeing other people's styles because even in the representational, traditional artist world, there's so many different types of art. I mean, you can have a mix of surrealism with traditional art, you have just pure traditional art, you have your landscapers and your, you know, still life painters and portrait painters. and. Everybody, even within that, has their own style. Like some are a little bit looser, and um, you know, some have hatching work and all this different thing. So I feel like if I were kind of condensed in my own little bubble, I wouldn't be able to learn. I wouldn't be able to expand as an artist. So being in an art community definitely provides that. And also, you get accolades if you're in different shows and things like that, which is definitely part of being in an artist community. People start to get to know your work, which is really important. The pandemic has been hard. At first, it was a little hard to get motivated to paint. I had so many paintings for shows and exhibitions for 2020 that were just sitting in my studio. And I just didn't know why I wanted to continue creating when I had so much inventory. But then I realized I'm an artist and that's all I can do. And that's all I really want to do 24 hours a day. I think just not being able to go to exhibitions, not being able to mix it up with other artists, to mingle and, and talk and um, just to communicate and be part of a community. That's been the really the toughest part for sure. Since the pandemic hit, I've been doing a lot more Zoom stuff and that has left me with a lot more time to work on my own stuff. I have a huge series that I'm working on right now and I'm about to approach a gallery with that series and I wouldn't have been able to finish it in a, the period that I was able to if it weren't for the pandemic. So it, it is really a blessing in disguise. The pandemic has had almost no effect on me because I work at home anyway. This is my studio. I almost never work here. The reason being is my two sons showed enormous talent as artists. And so I thought I should work at home so they can see the whole process. It would give them an art education. Totally turned them off to creating art. <laughs> Big mistake. But it became a habit. I still work at the dining room table at home. I am sort of naturally sequestered anyway doing all my work at home, I rarely leave the house. And so it, it hasn't been a big change in my life. As an artist, uh, my career has really um, evolved to the California Art Club. I've been able to take part in a lot of their shows and exhibitions they've offered for landscape painters, but I've also gotten to appreciate some of the other artists and what they offer. And it's really helped me kind of to open my eyes to different types of art, sculpture, drawing, the opportunity to work with other artists like me and to move forward in my career because of the California Art Club. I'm very proud to be a part of this group. It's a huge organization and they're growing so much bigger. I have collaborated actually with an amazing photographer. Her name is Cheryl Walsh 
and she specifically does underwater uh, photography. Usually I like to work partially from photographs and partially from the model. Because it was underwater, I wanted this very ethereal, floating kind of feel to the subjects and I could only get that with underwater photography. So we created this together and this is one of the series and it kind of evolved. First it was going to be kind of an elements kind of series around them. Based off of the pose, I decided to do something that surrealistic background with a very realistic figure and each picture that I'm painting in the series has some sort of element of nature kind of swirling around the figure. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. My most famous piece I've ever done was a movie poster I did back in 1977, the same year Star Wars came out. It was for the animated feature Wizards. And that is still one of the most popular things I sell. I sell prints of it. I do a new version of it every 10 years. I just came out with the first sculpted version. And I guess I peaked early. <laughs> Film-wise, uh, there's a couple films I'm really proud of. One is a little low-budget film that's become a gigantic cult movie. It's called The Return of the Living Dead. It's the true story of what really happened the night the dead people came back to life. And whenever they have a screening in LA, it sells out in minutes. It is, it's one of those rare films that's really funny and really scary at the same time. It's really hard to pull that off. I toured the United States for a year with the cast of the film and we went to every horror convention in the country during that year. And that movie is so popular. It's a lot of people's favorite film of all time. The other film I'm really proud of is Hans Labyrinth. And it's such a magnificent, beautiful fantasy film. Gamero invited me to see a screening with a whole bunch of makeup people. And these are guys who do this kind of bloody stuff and everything. And I'm hearing them gasp <laughs> with all these different scenes that are going on in the film. So I'm happy how that one came out. My first major film was Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I worked as a designer on Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Destroyer, Red Sonja, which was originally intended to be a Conan film at first. That was a gigantic breakthrough. Talk about lucky. I was hired to work with John Milius, one of the great screenwriters of all time. He wrote Apocalypse Now and wrote and directed Wind and the Lion. I got to work with Ron Cobb, a true genius, one of the greatest minds I've ever met in my life. We were sharing offices with Steven Spielberg, so we would work on Conan during the day and then work on Raiders of the Lost Ark at night. It was an extraordinary way to break into the film business and I thought it was always going to be like that, but it's, it's not. My love is portraiture. Portraiture, figure work, that kind of thing. What I'm doing right now is a combination of a portrait with either tool kind of wrapped around or a combination of that also with either gold or silver leaf in the background. And I have several of these small little paintings that I'm you know, getting ready to ship out to my gallery in uh, Scottsdale. Welcome to my studio. Please come in. Um, you can see on my easel, this is one of my bigger paintings uh, series that I'm working on. It's kind of an elemental series in a way where there's a woman who's surrealistically floating with um, so some sort of natural element kind of floating around her. This picture in particular is kind of a, I'm trying to embody the strength, but also the fragility of my model while also kind of speaking to spring and the, the leaves falling in the, the wind, how it kind of picks up in, in a soft, but like very forceful way. I'm dealing with a lot of small portraits at the moment. I have some portraits of, of little kids um, and I've dealt a little bit with like a, a gold leaf in the background. Um, and I wanted a whimsical feel to the painting. So I chose a background that I thought really embodied that. This one right here, as you can tell, is a self-portrait. This one I wanted actually kind of a royalness to it, which I really thought that the gold leaf helped with that. I keep thinking of um, icons and things like that that have that gold uh, like strength to them. And depending on the light, you can see there's a lot of sheen on both of these and it really like pops, um, which I, I love. Um, over here is one of my still lifes um, and I actually found the fabric first and I just loved it so much um, that I set up the whole still life around that fabric and um, first I, I found my vase um, that complemented it and then the flower colors also complement like a brighter version of the, of the fabric. Um, 
Yes, so let's go over again to the bigger paintings. This is another one of my big paintings. Uh, this one is called uh, Mariposa, which means butterfly. Actually turns out that my model, she's a very spiritual person. And after I was finished with this painting, I sent it to her and she said, oh my gosh, how did you know one of my totems? Just like a natural element that has some spiritual significance. So it kind of really went very well with the painting. So I chose butterflies just because I felt like it was very ethereal almost pose. This painting right here, also another self-portrait. I find um, even if I reuse a pose, like this is a pose actually that my model did for me, um, but I, I wanted something different instead of using the same face. So I uh, often will model for my own paintings, a free model. Um, but I wanted a, a royal feel again to this. And um, I tried to embody that with the roses kind of falling down. Um, she's almost kind of like a rose queen, has a crown of roses. And I just find that the color is this like, bluish green color in combination with the red just had this really royal feel to it. This painting was my first in the series actually, and um, it's titled Nevermore. It's um, inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poem, The Raven. And when I saw the photos of this model that my photographer took for me, she just had this, this feel of like she's reaching up towards something and I remembered this poem where she's this person who's reaching for her her lover that she's never you know going to reach so that's pretty much it for my my bigger series i have a couple others that i'm working on at the moment but um they will you'll have to wait <laughs> to see those until they're done California Art Club's uh, exhibition at the Old Mill titled The Golden State is a group of paintings by California Art Club artists. Each one is a different view through the artist's eyes. They're almost like self-portraits of the artist. My painting here is entitled Morning in Laguna and it's a plein air piece and I thought it might be a beautiful scene at sunrise so I got out there before dawn, set up and waited for the sun to come out and I was very happy with the results of the light. So this is an early morning scene. I love atmosphere, I love color, and it, it paid off to get up before dawn for me. This is my gouache painting called Doheny Morning. It's a plein air piece, and because the show is called The Golden State, I decided to give my interpretation of what The Golden State is to me. I'm a beach person, a coastal person, and this scene I painted at Doheny has everything that is in my life. It's got surfers, the beach, toes in the sand, volleyball, warm sun, and the lifeguard tower. And for me, that, that represents the golden state in my life. Um, it was a fun little piece to paint out on the beach. Anytime I can work on the beach, is a good thing. Kevin McPherson's painting here is a nocturne of Catalina, and it's almost a tonalist painting, I wanna say. It's a lot of green with the complementary reds thrown in there to help balance it out. And it's a beautiful impressionist painting of the moonlight in Catalina. If you get up close, you can see lots of little impressionist brushstrokes, such subtle little tones and details that you don't see from far back. And it really comes together well. Rick Humphrey's painting, The Lighthouse at Point Reyes, is a beautifully designed and composed painting. It sells a lot smaller and tighter brushwork it's a gouache and a watercolor, but it's designed with your eye going down the hill to lighthouse, leading off the painting into the sun and the glare on the water, and just beautifully painted. Dura Wasim's painting of the Capitola Bridge is 
almost an abstract painting in its own right. It's got these beautiful girders and little color notes in between in the negative space, and it has a very geometric and abstract feel to it, even though it's probably an impressionist plein air painting, or perhaps even a studio painting, but it's such a unique, different style. And you stand back and everything comes together with the color and the design and the drawing. And again, a beautiful painting. It just goes to show you that each of these representational traditional paintings in the show are all unique and they're the artist's vision. And they may be traditional, they may be realist, but they're all very different in the way they're painted, the way they're handled, and what they're communicating through the artist.